Uh, welcome, everybody, to Fredrickson and Byron. My name is Richard Weiner. I'm the head of the International Department here at Fredrickson and Byron. I'd like to personally welcome you to this seminar on, uh, on cross-border issues and mergers and acquisitions. We have three terrific panelists. They're all actually from uh, Fredrickson and Byron this morning. So I'd like to introduce all three of them uh, now, and then we'll get started. Our first speaker will be Harley Brown. Harley is to the right of you at the end there. And Harley's a shareholder in our international department. His uh, corporate and securities practice involves assisting clients with a wide range of uh, corporate issues, trans financial transactions, including aspects of public and private offerings of securities, as well as mergers and acquisitions. He also advises clients on entity formation, state corporate laws, and corporate governance issues. Harley ho holds a uh, bachelor's degree from Minnesota State University at Moorhead, a law degree from Hamlin University, and a Master's of Law in International Comparative Law from the Free University of Brussels in Belgium. Uh, Harley's going to be speaking about trends in uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions, with particular emphasis on Europe. Our second speaker will be Pat Kelly. Pat's in the middle there, for those of you who don't know Pat. I think everybody knows Pat, but anyway, for those of you who don't, Pat's in the middle. Um, uh, Pat has more than 28 years of experience as a commercial lawyer, representing clients both domestically and internationally. He's chair of our Latin America practice group, and while he works with clients doing business all over the world, he has particular expertise in Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Panama, and Latin America generally. Pat has experience representing clients on a broad range of international business matters, ranging from mergers and acquisitions, um, private equity, financing, securing debt, foreign investment, entity selection, and tax structuring. Pat holds a bachelor's degree from St. John's University with a uh, law degree from the University of Minnesota. Pat's going to be speaking on due diligence issues generally in mergers and acquisitions, but with particular emphasis on Latin America. And our third speaker today, our final speaker, is Bob Oberleaves, right here to my right, this guy over here. Um, and Bob is a trusted advisor to global companies on complex international transactions, including advising on several of the largest M&A deals between North America and China. Bob has helped clients on their most sensitive and strategic projects across the Americas and into Asia, with particular emphasis on China, assisting multinational companies and private equity firms in successfully growing their business operations in Asia and in completing key acquisitions on, of a global nature. Uh, Bob holds a bachelor's degree from um, Holy Cross College in Boston and a law degree from Northwestern University in Chicago. And um, Bob's going to be talking to us today about uh, uh, trends generally, but structuring M&A deals with particular emphasis in China. But before we begin, I'd like to ask J.B. Sherpels to come up and say a few words on behalf of Global Minnesota, one of our sponsors for today's conference. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. As Rich said, um, my name is J.B. Shorpels, and I work for Global Minnesota. Uh, we're a nonprofit based here in the Twin Cities that does a range of programming on just global issues. And one of the things we do specifically is work with our corporate partners to co-sponsor and do events like today. So I just wanted to introduce myself and to thank the, uh, our corporate members who are here today, including Ide Bailey, Fredrickson and Byron, um, including Pat Kelly, who serves on our board, uh, Global Tax Network, Target, UHG, and Wells Fargo. We do, again, a range of programs year-round that are geared towards our corporate audience, as well as cultural programming on global issues. Of specific interest is if you are doing work in Colombia or Latin America, we're hosting the Colombian Ambassador April 24th and 25th, including a public luncheon on Monday, April 24th. So if you're doing work in that region or country, See me afterwards, um, or if you have other questions about Global Minnesota. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. And without any further ado, I'd like to bring up our first speaker. Harley, it's all yours. So as Pat said, I'm a, a shareholder in the corporate group. Um, the vast majority of my practice is focused on M&A, and about half the transactions I'm doing have a significant OUS component to them. Um, I'll be speaking today about uh, uh, trends um, both in M&A uh, generally and also um, spending about half the time talking about differences um, that you can expect to see in uh, U.S. purchase agreements versus European purchase agreements, understanding that um, even speaking of, uh, you know, European purchase agreements sort of homogenizes a uh, number of different uh, legal cultures. Um, 
Overall, uh, transaction volume for M&A um, on the whole was, was high in uh, 2016. If you take a look at the slide here, um, the third highest on record, um, 3.9 trillion in 2016. Um, the 83% uh, of respondents to KPMG's M&A Market Pulse study indicated that they anticipated closing a deal by the end of 2016, and 84 uh, anticipated closing at least uh, one transaction in 2017. Oh, sorry. Uh, results and outlook for 2017 are positive. Um, we have limited information uh, at this point, um, but what we do have uh, shows uh, good volume overall. Um, European M&A volume hit an 11-year high in January of 2017 with EMEA uh, volumes of $90.8 billion, um, and that was driven by several sort of mega deals. Um, Cross-border M&A as a, as a percentage of that has continued to grow. 31% um, of the total volume in 2015 was cross-border M&A. Um, in 2016, that rose to 36%. Um, I think just um, uh, anecdotally, um, in the office here, I think for most of the folks that are doing M&A, we'd say that at least half the transactions that we do have um, a significant OUS component to them these days. Um, the leading sectors in terms of M&A um, worldwide are technology, power, energy, uh, real estate, and healthcare. Um, and uh, the UK and Europe uh, continue, or excuse me, the UK and Europe, which for purposes of this Deloitte study, and don't include the sort of uh, larger countries in Europe, um, are uh, two of the top five outbound markets um, for uh, M&A transactions. Um, the UK in particular, in particular is very interesting um, for um, outbound M&A. 40% of uh, PE uh, respondents to a Deloitte study indicated that, um, that the UK was the market that they were most interested in doing M&A. And 29% um, and of strategics uh, indicated the same with respect to uh, <coughs> So um, lots of uh, volume in uh, 2016. Um, and uh, as of yet, the information we have for 2017 um, looks strong. Um, the drivers for M&A remain largely the same as they have uh, in, in past years. Um, limited organic growth options, um, companies utilizing M&A, to respond to changes in the marketplace. Um, the biggest uh, driver for M&A continues to be the expansion or diversification of products with 22% um, of those responding to the Deloitte study um, citing that as the biggest factor. But we still th see things such as acquisition to new, acquisition of new regions um, for product sales, products and know-how, diversification, um, and acquisition of uh, talent in, in terms of employees. Um, Utilize, uh, excuse me, strategic and PE buyers continue to hold records amounts of cash. Um, this next slide shows um, the amount of dry powder on hand at, at private equity firms. Um, it's the highest amount on record, $822 billion. Um, as folks know, uh, those, pers those funds um, are under great pressure to deploy those funds. All of them have you know, a certain lifeline uh, in which they need to use those funds, after which they need to be returned to the partners. Um, and there's also heightened uh, competition for um, good acquisition targets um, with uh, both um, strategics um, and uh, strategic um, or alternative investors. So um, uh, foreign qualified or foreign sovereign funds um, and uh, uh, home offices, things of that nature. Um, interest rates are also historically low. So all of these have, have led to the um, heightened activity that we see and have seen in 2015, 2016. And, and provide um, what should be a good 2017. Um, that being said, um, there are a number of uh, factors that we can look at that, uh, that would potentially have an impact on, um, on M&A uh, going forward. Um, geopolitical changes, I think we all see sort of in the news every day, we understand the interconnectedness of the world. Um, heightened regulator scrutiny, 2016, was the highest volume on record of nixed deals, um, including deals that um, the parties themselves uh, took apart as a result of regulator scrutiny. Um, speculation around Brexit in China. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on um, Brexit um, at a later point in time, but um, uh, fair to say that the, the only certainty is that it's very uncertain at this point in time. 
and then the new administration in the United States um, with things such as a, a reduction in the corporate um, income tax rate, uh, repatriation of cash at uh, uh, lower rates, um, uh, tariffs, things like that. Um, I think there is a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, however, um, for the most part, you continue to see sort of cautious optimism, um, at least among the clients um, that I'm working with. Um, with respect to Brexit in particular, um, despite the fact that there is this uncertainty out there, um, you did see a, a number of deals close in 2016, um, and, and part of that was driven by um, the uh, reduction, 20% uh, uh, reduction in the value of the pound vis-a-vis um, -vis the U.S. dollar. So um, investments in the U.K. in particular looked very good to, to investors at that point in time. I had a transaction that was, that was in the process of closing um, sort of while the Brexit vote was happening, and the parties did take a step back and take a breath um, when, that, when that took place. Um, and they ultimately ended up um, consummating the deal, but some of the hard dollars up front um, ended up uh, being turned into earnout dollars. So I think you can expect to see um, things like that being used to, um, for investors to kind of uh, hedge their bets against uh, the changes in, in, in the UK. Um, while, the, while the volume was high in 2016, um, in 2017, a number of commentators have come out and said, uh, that they expect that the uncertainty will lead to a reduction um, in the, the deal volume um, and that much of what's been driven, what been driving kind of the significant um, volume over there has been, uh, you know, a limited number of very large deals. Um, I'll spend a bit, uh, kind of the last half of my time here talking about differences you can expect to see in a, in a U.S. and European purchase agreement um, in terms um, as... Uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to talk about a European purchase agreement. Obviously, um, each country um, has very different, oftentimes, um, legal cultures and legal systems. Um, that being said, what I've done is I've taken the results of um, the U.S. Um, ABA studies that they prepare every couple of years for private transactions and compared those to um, uh, similar surveys that are put together um, by their European counterparts, um, just to take a look at um, some things that, that, that may be interesting to you. Um, uh, in particular, we'll talk about purchase price adjustments, um, disclosure, um, closing conditions, indemnification, both respect to limitations um, and damages, and then restrictive covenants. Um, I think just to start off in general, um, I, I, I read an interesting article. There are a lot of articles out there that come out as a result of these studies um, to try and take a look at them and sort of discern general trends that you can see in terms of U.S. Um, and, and European uh, M&A and sort of uh, influences uh, each might have on one another. And I, I think um, the, the one comment that I found most interesting, a, a U.K. author um, had indicated that um, U.S. Uh, purchase agreements tend to be less concise was the phrase that was used. And I think that there's a general sense uh, that, and, and it has been my experience as well, that um, oftentimes the U.S. purchase agreement uh, tends to be lengthier and cover, um, cover more things in terms of, uh, in more depth, uh, in terms of representations and warranties um, and uh, um, purchase price adjustments and things like that. So I, I, found, I found the use of the term concise to be uh, particularly telling and also um, in line with my experience there. And the first item I'll talk about is um, working capital adjustments. Um, as most people know, um, you know, most private transactions are done on a cash-free, debt-free basis with a normalized level of working capital. Um, how that often plays out in a U.S.-style purchase agreement um, is that the parties agree on a working capital target and then adjust, um, adjust uh, both oftentimes at close and also post-close um, to confirm that the sort of value of the company um, that was agreed upon in terms of determining the enterprise value is met so that the, the buyer knows that they're getting kind of what the company is worth, quote unquote. And that's the benefit of such a system. Um, the downside of it is that if you're a seller, um, there's oftentimes uh, going to be an adjustment post-close. And to the extent that you don't have um, the ability um, to draw funds easily uh, or sort of recapture funds, um, that can prove difficult. 
Um, what you oftentimes see um, in European purchase agreements, um, although I, I, as I will preface this by saying I think I've done deals where I've seen both on, on probably pr pretty much all of these topics, um, is a lockbox concept, which is a concept whereby the parties agree as of typically the signing of the agreement, um, they will do an adjustment so that the purchase price is agreed upon um, as of the signing and that uh, there will be restrictive covenants in the agreement such that um, any leakage that occurs um, between sign and close is really sort of written off by the parties. There's really not um, coverage for it, except to the extent that, they, they, um, that one of the parties, really the seller, um, violates one of those restrictive covenants. So restrictive covenant that would keep a... Um, that would keep a seller from, uh, you know, c collecting AR more quickly, um, reducing the amount of inventory that it has on hand. Um, things like that would be covered. Um, this is beneficial um, to the to the seller, um, and it is um, being utilized by a lot of um, European private equity firms because at the end of the day, it does provide the price certainty, um, so that after the fact, um, you know, folks aren't coming back and looking for additional um, funds. Um, SRS uh, Aquium did a study and indicated that for those um, agreements that had a post-close adjustment in them, 65% um, of the time there was an adjustment, which I don't think is surprising to anyone. There, there almost always is an adjustment in my experience. It, it may be small dollars, but there is an adjustment after the fact. Um, and that to the extent it related to financial statements, um, that the uh, adjustment uh, oftentimes took um, nine months was sort of the period of time to resolve that. So. Um, you know, uh, expenses in connection with that and a, a bit of a headache, uh, resources drain. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's sort of the difference between the two. Um, in terms of disclosure, um, in the U.S., you know, if you've been through the M&A process, you appreciate that the diligence and disclosure process um, is a miserable process, but, uh, it, you know, largely a uh, large amount of documents will be dumped into a data room and, and we will um, employ... Um, uh, what, what looks like um, thousands of minions to uh, run through those documents and confirm that, uh, you know, that, that there are no uh, risks uh, inherent in them. Um, disclosure in the U.S., um, the practice that has arisen is that disclosures are made very specifically, both with respect to the disclosure itself and to the representations that the disclosure is being made around. Um, disclosures are set forth in a detailed disclosure set, schedule statement. Um, general disclosures are uh, strongly discouraged and um, really only occur um, in instances where the seller has um, considerable leverage. Um, in connection with that, um, we oftentimes uh, tie this to sandbagging provisions, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, the idea here is that, uh, I like this phrase, judges are not like pigs hunting for truffles um, buried in briefs. The idea is that um, as a U.S. buyer, the, the seller should be the party who is most aware um, of uh, when a disclosure or when a disclosure is necessary as a result of a breach or, or what would be a breach of a representation. And therefore, it is the responsibility of the seller to make very clear um, what that disclosure is and where it needs to be set out. Um, in contrast, and particularly in the U.K., um, there's a dis disclosure letter that is often delivered in connection with the, with the closing. Um, it's similar to the U.S. disclosure schedules, and again, this is you know, a generalized statement, but um, it tends to allow for more generalized um, disclosures. Um, uh, there is also a concept that you see uh, sometimes introduced in U.K. deals where there is sort of disclosure of everything that is included in the data room, um, which is sort of uh, anathema to what we have here in the States. Um, there is a fair disclosure doctrine uh, that has arisen in the UK um, in response to this practice, whereby if something is included in the data room that is not you know, readily apparent on its face, um, that it would apply to um, uh, a, a specific representation, that that won't be um, applied in a way such that you wouldn't be able to claim damages later. But very different practice in terms of what you're allowed to disclose, how broad the disclosures are, and sort of... Um, uh, generally, uh, whether or not the the whole of the what is disclosed is um, include or what is disclosed in terms of documentation is incorporated into what you've seen in the purchase agreement. In terms of closing conditions, these are just a couple of things I thought were interesting. Um, both of these closing conditions, um, accuracy of the representations and material adverse change um, or event, 
Um, both of these are found um, in 90% plus. The accuracy of representations was found in um, all of the U.S. deals reported in 2013 and 2015. Material adverse change event um, was found uh, in 90% plus. So, you know, these are the types of things that you would see in almost every um, U.S. transaction. Accuracy of representations focus on the representations being accurate um, either in all respects or in all material respects as of the signing and or closing. Um, in uh, Europe, um, the accuracy of representation was found in 44% and 36% um, of European M&A. And so that, um, that reflects, you know, obviously a, a substantial difference in how often you see something like that. Um, material adverse uh, change or event um, was likewise um, seen in 90% of uh, U.S. purchase agreements that were covered for this period, whereas it was only seen in 30% for the 2030 and 2013 and 2015 studies. Um, I looked into just a little bit to see sort of the rationale from some of the um, treatises on this, and um, there's a generalized sense that um, European business executives are less willing to introduce doubt into the agreements around the ability to close a transaction. Um, there's also been a lot of litigation, particularly with respect to material adverse change event. I think there's a lot of legal time and blood spilt on it, but I, I, I think there's been very limited number, if any, sort of instances in which one's been found. And so, um, again, just an interesting, um, an interesting difference in them. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of these topics because uh, I know I'm running late. But um, in terms of uh, indemnification limitations, um, survival periods, um, Whereas in the U.S., you oftentimes see in private M&A a small number of very fundamental representations um, defined as the fundamental representations. You often see them being indefinite or for very lengthy periods. I and mean, it's been my experience that um, in European transactions, um, in some countries, the, you, you just can't have survival periods that are indefinite in length. Um, and that uh, the, the survival periods on the whole tend to be shorter with respect, with respect to the fundamental reps. <laughs> Um, the basket and deductible concepts. Um, what was interesting uh, around this is that um, the tipping basket, or the idea that um, if uh, if there is a certain dollar amount that's set out in the purchase agreement, um, and you need to essentially um, uh, make a claim for more than that dollar amount before you can actually seek damages um, against the seller, the tipping basket was much more prevalent um, in European deals, whereas the straight deductible or a dollar amount that's just written off um, is much more uh, found much more in um, U.S. transactions. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the on the remaining ones on this one. In terms of indemnification and damages, I think the biggest thing here, and and this is particularly the case um, with respect to U.K. transactions, but. So for U.S. deals, you know, damages are based on the amount that is needed to rectify a breach. So if um, if there is a uh, if there is an environmental permit that isn't on hand at the time, um, and a party needs to go out and get that permit, and also faces a fine as as a result of a failure not to have it, that's the amount of the breach. Um, there's no link between that dollar amount and um, sort of the value of the target itself as a result of that breach. So um, no, no link between the two. Um, and there's um, oftentimes in U.S. purchase agreements no duty for the um, buyer to mitigate any damages that it might have. Now, you know, that's subject to... Um, subject to negotiation, and, and you see that go both ways. But oftentimes, uh, the, the mitigation duty um, is eliminated from the purchase agreement. Um, in the UK, um, most deals do not calculate damages on an indemnity basis. Um, I have um, worked on deals where we have sort of had US concepts in a, in a UK setting or in UK deals. Um, but the focus is really on the loss of value of the target. So instead of focusing on the value to rectify, you really have to then take the next step, which is showing that the um, damages um, actually reduced the value of the company or the target. And so, um, again, a higher burden, um, less likely to result in um, indemnifiable or at least collectible damages um, from vis-a-vis -vis kind of a U.S. situation. Um, and there is an obligation to mitigate that um, that you would see almost always um, throughout uh, particularly um, UK transactions. And finally, with respect to restrictive covenants, I think folks know that, um, you know, that non-competes, non-solicit, non-hire provisions, um, you know, you will almost always find them um, in transactions other than when you've got sort of a, 
maybe a large financial um, investor or institutional investor that, that is selling. Um, I think the standard in U.S. for um, private M&A transactions is five years. You almost always start with that, and depending upon the leverage of the parties, you might reduce it to two or three years. But five is kind of kind of where you roll out and is customary. Um, in the U.K. in particular, um, I think you'll find generally in Europe um, there is much more of a sense like you have in California, that uh, restrictive covenants and particularly non-competes are um, uh, something that is generally against public policy, the idea being that you don't want to put a person in a situation where they're unable to um, you know, provide for themselves and their families. Um, and so oftentimes, as is the case here in the states where from state to state you may have state limitations on how long those covenants can run and, and sort of other restrictions, um, in particular, in the UK, you've got a limit of um, three years, but you'll oftentimes see less than that. And I think just generally, um, you know, when I when I'm doing a transaction in Europe and and there are restrictive covenants set forth there, and you know, they they tend more often to be that 12 to 24 months as opposed to the 60 months that we sort of roll out with here in the states. Um, that's what I have for information, and uh, thank you for your time today. I do apologize. I actually have a financing that is scheduled to close this morning so that we can close a transaction in Italy and Romania tomorrow morning. So I'm going to step out, but I will return, and um, we'll just return to the back of the room and, and have a chance to meet with you afterwards. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. So how many of you speak Spanish? We'll have to do this in English then. <laughs> um, Charlie, where did you uh, put the... So um, my name is Pat Kelly. Um, I uh, oversee the Latin America Practice Group. Um, and we do deals all over Latin America. And um, most of our deals, I would say, are deals involving U.S. companies um, acquiring Mexican businesses or acquiring um, Mexican operations of other U.S. companies. And so um, a lot of what we do is similar in terms of how we document deals here from a, from a purchase agreement perspective, that's where it all kind of the similarities end. Um, everything else is uh, a little bit different. Um, Harley and I were talking about what constitutes a normal deal, and I'm not sure what a normal deal is. I'm not sure there is a normal deal in an M&A context, but <clears throat> in Latin America, normal deals are, um, are not normal. So... Um, so what are we going to cover? We're going to cover the current market and future trends, uh, preliminary planning for deals in Latin America, um, due diligence and key provisions, and I'll probably spend very little time on key provisions, but I do want to spend some time on due diligence just because that's kind of really where the rubber hits the road in these deals in Latin America, um, because the due diligence process is much more difficult, and, um, and, and that's kind of where your, your key time is spent, I think. So <clears throat> in uh, 2016, uh, the value of Mexican M&A decreased by 9% um, compared to the previous year, uh, despite a 2% increase in the number of transactions uh, compared to 2015. The markets where the most deals in Mexico were were real estate, uh, financial, and retail and distribution. Um, most of the deals that we are seeing are manufacturing related, um, but the biggest deals are the deals in these categories. So activity as of 2017 is somewhat down. Uh, 27 deals per month uh, in 2016 compared to about 20 in January, which is a very short time period, of course, to, to try to get a snapshot. But um, nine of those deals disclose transaction values of one point. Uh, $5, $3 billion. Um, in 2017, the outlook for M&A is um, somewhat uncertain due to all the factors that we've already talked about. Um, the uh, talk in the Trump administration of imposing import taxes and uh, 
preventing companies from expanding uh, in uh, Mexico is having a dampening effect. Um, although I, I have to say that um, it's also being looked at as an opportunity for a lot of companies because um, we're seeing some increase in activity. Um, in two, uh, 2017, real estate financial and insurance firms showed the highest activity uh, by sector with a total of four transactions each, uh, followed by internet-based and technology firms. One of the deals that we're working on right now in, in Mexico is actually a software deal. Um, there are um, sectors in Mexico now that are focusing, geographic sectors that are focusing on different industries, and the software and uh, aviation sectors are, are very strong right now. And so we're seeing uh, increased activity in that, and then kind of the, the constant is the auto industry and the supporting um, companies that, that feed that, that industry. Um, with, regard, with regard to cross-border deals, Mexican firms did the most deals with Spain, uh, U.S., and Colombia, Panama, and Luxembourg, which I'm sure was using holding company, um, you know, uh, doing holding company deals. Um, so, you know, what, is, what are the advantages and disadvantages right now? The dollar is strong against the peso. Um, so we have more buying power. Um, and... The Mexican energy sector has gone through some reforms over the last few years. Uh, there have been auctions of uh, energy contracts. There's now an uh, ability to do joint ventures and to uh, kind of work more closely with the energy sector in Mexico, and that's opening up that sector. Uh, the problem is, of course, commodity prices have dropped, and so that sector is, uh, is somewhat weak. And while those auctions have continued, there's still been some holding back. So I haven't, uh, I haven't seen much uh, M&A activity um, in that industry yet. Um, the other kind of uh, wild card for Mexico is that the election is coming up in 2018. Um, we have Trump, who um, doesn't restrain you know, much of what he's thinking, and then Mexico has Obrador, who uh, used to be uh, uh, the head of Mexico City, essentially, and... And he is kind of a Mexican version of Trump. And he has said that, for example, if, uh, if he's president, he's going to cancel NAFTA or renegotiate it or you know, do everything kind of uh, on the counter um, side of what, what Trump has been talking about. And so there's a lot of uncertainty as to what could happen if Obrador becomes the next president of Mexico. So preliminary cult, uh, considerations. Um, of course, there's local cultural considerations. Um, there is a, a much stronger sense in Mexico of a handshake deal, uh, and that kind of permeates through the, uh, the legal culture in Mexico. Um, the other thing that is important to take into account is that even now, most of the deals in Mexico are with family-owned businesses. Uh, the vast majority of businesses in Mexico um, are, if not completely family-owned, substantially family-owned, and <coughs> that history and that kind of personal involvement um, impacts how deals are done. Um, we use non-binding letters of intent, although under Mexican law you have to be careful because that concept is, is more of an American concept than a Mexican concept, and you want to be careful that you're not stuck being bound by a non-binding letter of intent. Asset purchase or stock purchase, as in many European uh, countries, whether you do one or the other, your, the impact on you as a buyer may be the same because you may still have successor liability uh, even if you've done an asset deal uh, because you've taken over substantially all of the business. Um, entity structure, um, we are still doing most of our deals um, through setting up Mexican subsidiaries, uh, SRLs, which are limited liability companies. We can do check the box elections. Um, very seldom do we see uh, using a, an SA structure. Uh, and then successor liability, uh, as I mentioned, are, are considerations. Um, you know, it's important to kind of start these deals out by getting a sense of how the due diligence is going to be done. Because I've had everything from, I, well, I've done deals in Mexico that are everywhere from a, a million dollars to $3.2 billion. And in a lot of the middle range, the due diligence process really doesn't change that much. It's much more informal. Um, I get documents in boxes still. 
um, you know, we have to load them up, scan, you know, scan them, load them up, and, and put them into the, the data room. Um, but, you know, it's, it's important in any deal to, to set this up, but, uh, but we will look at who we have access to. Um, Mexican culture, uh, business culture, is a much more top-down culture, so you have to be uh, very careful who you're, who you're getting information from. Um, due diligence. Uh, one of the things that's very uh, different in Mexico and in a lot of code countries is that you don't have, for example, a UCC um, uh, registry or some place where you can easily go in and get information on um, filings. Um, security interests in Mexico are, uh, can be filed with the uh, public registry. There can be a, a filing at a court. Um, or, you know, you can have um, possession, which is probably the only way to really make sure you've got um, your hands on the, uh, on the collateral. Um, the other thing that we have to be careful about is when doing stock deals, it's not uncommon in Mexico to have straw people. Uh, you may have uh, a lot of um, big family-owned uh, businesses where they're trying to protect assets, and they'll use various people either in the family or in the circle of, you know, trusted advisors to own stock. And so it can become a little bit confusing when you're going in to acquire these interests where you're talking to somebody who's purporting to be the owner but legally doesn't own the, the uh, shares. Um, default provisions of the code versus what's in the document uh, themselves, as in all code countries, uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, hard-boiled into the code. And so you have to take that into account um, and uh, make sure that you're not surprised later on. So who owns the equity? We've talked about that. Straw people. Um, rights, rights associated with shares, units, and quotas. Uh, again, these can be hard-boiled into the code where uh, people have pre uh, preferential or preemptive rights, and they're not particularly used to having uh, shareholder agreements or other kinds of agreements that change those rights. Um, you want to make sure that the, the books uh, and records are up to date. You'd be surprised uh, how much of an issue that uh, is. And then uh, how they're transferred. SRL interests uh, are transferred by agreement, stock certificates, and stock deals can be transferred just as they are here. Um, another big issue in Mexico, and I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, is powers of attorney. Who has authority to act on behalf of the company? Uh, many times we'll go in and we'll do diligence. Uh, we'll look at the Articles of Incorporation of the Mexican entity to see what powers of attorney were granted in that document, and then we'll go and look at other powers of attorney. And these are usually registered in the public registries, and uh, although they don't necessarily have to be. Um, and so you want to go in and find out who has a power of attorney uh, because those people can have a lot of power uh, to transfer assets, to sign contracts, to do things of that sort. You want to revoke the ones you don't need and grant new ones to the ones you do need. Um, access to financials. Um, it's more common now to see audited financials, especially in more sophisticated businesses where there is a um, kind of a, an idea that they may be um, selling the business in the future. Um, but we still run into, uh, I would say, a majority of deals where they're not audited. Um, uh, if, there, if there's an American or a foreign ownership connection, I would say that's, it's more common to have audited, uh, but, but in general, I would say it's not. Um, you know, differences in accounting standards, Mexico has Mexican um, uh, FRS uh, versus U.S. GAAP or Mexican GAAP, so um, you just want to make sure you're looking at, you know, apples and apples or, or translating that as best you can. Um, differences in financial controls. Um, one of the things that we run into um, that's very frustrating is the family business that has six different operations and there's money going all, the, all over the place. And so tracking and, and trying to figure out those financials can be very difficult. Uh, I say this uh, a little bit in jest about how many sets of books, but I've done deals in Brazil and um, Chile and, and Mexico where the owner is saying, I don't understand where you're telling me it's only worth uh, $25 million. 
if you look at my books, um, not those books, these books, it's worth $100 million. And they literally will have you know, uh, several sets of books. And they want you to look at the one that they're not necessarily showing the, uh, uh, the Mexican IRS. You just have to be very careful about that. And of course, it's hard to explain to them that we, you know, we're basing our purchase on what's, what's in the books. Um, you know, our taxes being paid on the correct financials or on the other financials. Um, and then we get into conversations about reserves and things of that sort. Again, machinery and equipment, there's two issues where it's, where it's registered and whether it was imported, if it was imported from the United States. Was it imported correctly? Was it imported as part of a Maquila IMEX program? If it, was, if it was imported as part of an IMEX program, has it been uh, in the country too long? Has it been uh, deemed to be permanently imported? Has VAT tax been paid on it? Uh, you don't want to buy equipment and then find out that you owe 16% um, VAT tax on the value of the equipment because it's deemed to have been permanently imported because somebody messed up how it was imported as part of an IMEX program. Um, we need to match invoices with what are called pedimentos, and that process is basically an audit process. It can be prolonged, and, it, and you know, you're looking through boxes in a warehouse. So um, although I have to say now it's, it's mostly electronic. Um, another thing to be um, aware of, and this is probably true in many European countries, is that in Mexico, um, you can have a lien on assets or on real estate uh, as a result of employee disputes, uh, and those disputes will take first priority over other security interests. So it's important to make sure that you're doing your diligence on, on that aspect of things. Um, other assets, computer software, I had a deal uh, a couple of years ago where the company had plants in five locations in Mexico, and I think they had two original sets of software, um, which has uh, become a problem. Um, they're, of course, having to go through and uh, pull all the old um, bootleg software and put in new software, and they've gotten audited by this, and it's, um, it's not, you know, not a good process to have to do after closing. Um, inventory, again, uh, audit, and we've talked a little bit about MX. Um, intellectual property uh, is filed with MP. Um, the, uh, it's very easy to search this now. It's electronic. You can go online and, and uh, look at it. Um, trademarks, no common law rights, unlike in the United States. So the only way you get rights um, is to uh, actually file the, um, the registration. Trademarks are good for 10 years, can be renewed indefinitely. Patents are 20 years. Uh, contracts and arrangements sim similar to the United States, although I will say that in um, Mexico um, there is a high degree of handshake deals. Um, uh, in the employment context, there's kind of an old, uh, old school vision that, you know, if I give you a blank piece of paper and you sign it, I can fill in whatever I want later if I have a dispute. And so that's... <laughs> You know, that's something to keep an eye on as well. Um, liabilities, again, um, how are they documented? How are they perfected? Where are they registered? Are they registered? Um, it's, it's a bit of ferreting out um, these things in order to get to uh, a clear picture. Contingent claims here, I think the, the biggest uh, claims to be aware of or the biggest um, aspects uh, of contingent claims to be aware of are the labor uh, claims because of um, there being a statutory uh, severance in Mexico where it's basically laid out in the code, in the labor code, how much you pay based on a um, termination with cause, termination without cause, uh, retirement, death, etc. And so um, you can calculate what that accrual is. Um, and I've run into problems in M&A deals where um, there hasn't been an accrual or we've had independent contractors who've never been paid um, benefits and things of that sort. And after the, as we get to closing, we realize that there's this contingent liability where if they, those people were deemed employees, there could be a significant impact on the value of the deal just because of 
of that employee-related liability. Same thing comes up in the customs context if, again, you have things that were not properly imported. Um, you know, family businesses, I've already talked a little bit about that. A lot of times we have loans going back and forth to family members. We have people who are on the salary. They're getting paid as consultants, um, all kinds of different uh, arrangements there, to, mostly to avoid taxes. Um, litigation. Uh, this is another important area. You cannot just um, pull a search from the courts in Mexico or in, in anywhere in Latin America. Um, you can only get that information if you're a party to a litigation. And so um, it's an important disclosure item, and it's, it's a, a difficult item to uh, make sure of. You can go through private investigators. There are attorneys who have relationships with the courts um, and can maybe get that information for you, but it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, licenses and approvals uh, with Maquilas, of course, this is critical. Um, as in, you know, medical device, we want to make sure that uh, we've got import rights, et cetera. Foreign investment restrictions, not so much in the typical industries that you would expect. Antitrust is, um, you know, it's a pretty easy process in Mexico to get clearance on that. Um, labor and employment, I think I've, I'm going to go through this, uh, skip over it because I've talked about it um, uh, already, except to say that in the context of deals. The issue of how to get employees from point A to point B is going to come up. And there's going to be a, a serious discussion about it because somebody's going to have to bear the cost of paying for severance or accepting um, the seniority and the accrual um, and, you know, kind of pushing it down the road. I would say the most common way of doing this is to do what's called a substitution of employee. I'm sorry, substitution of employer where basically the new company, uh, the, the acquiring company, agrees to take all of the employees or those employees that it wants to take with all their benefits, all their salary, and all their seniority. If you don't do that, they're deemed to be um, terminated and they're entitled to get severance. Um, successor liability, again, you know, is an issue with uh, employment. Um, expat employees don't. Don't be lulled into believing that because you have a U.S. employee who's working in Mexico under a U.S. contract, that if they're terminated in Mexico, they're going to rely upon their U.S. contract. I've got a deal right now where a, a U.S. employee has been working in Mexico for 18 years and is uh, getting benefits under his U.S. contract and is suing under uh, the Mexican labor law to get all of the entitlements he's entitled to under that, which in this case amount to almost a half a million dollars. Uh, key provisions, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm not going to spend much time on these um, because I think Harley's pretty much talked about what they are in U.S. deals, and there really isn't much difference in Mexican deals except that you get much more pushback about um, uh, escrows. Um, Mexican sellers are very loath to put uh, any money into escrow and not to get that, and if they do, not to get that money back quickly. Um, another um, uh, thing that I want to mention is escrow in general. Um, I, would, uh, I would advise you not to escrow in Mexico. Uh, if you've got a deal that has a met, an escrow, escrow in the United States or escrow somewhere else. Um, I would say the key... Um, issue with respect to uh, making sure that you've got good due diligence, good reps and warranties, and, um, you know, and, and some method of supporting indemnification in the form of escrow or something else, is to keep in mind that if it falls apart um, and you are litigating in Mexico, uh, it's, it's not a good result. Um, the court system is uh, not... Um, uh, easy to rely upon, and it's not fast. So um, hopefully uh, those, give, those uh, comments, these comments give you a little bit of an idea of what a, what a deal in Mexico is like. If you have any other questions, please. Uh, have um, sports not compete with, if you buy a house, family, or any business, what can you restrict them to in Mexico for sales so they don't start competing with you next door? 
Yeah, that's a good point, and I, I did want to hit that point. In, in Mexico, uh, non-competes are unenforceable. Uh, the Constitution prohibits you from limiting uh, the rights of employees to, to work. And so you can do non-solicitations, uh, but it's, it's not even a question. You can't do a non-compete. Oh, Brazil. Um, Brazil is pretty much the same way. Um, the, the issue that you, I mean, you, you'll see this in a lot of agreements, uh, employment agreements in Mexico and in uh, M&A deal uh, agreements where there are restrictive covenants. Um, and maybe the Mexican party is not going to talk about them, but they know, they know that it's not enforceable. And the courts in Mexico are extremely, um, you know, slanted towards supporting uh, employee rights. Yeah, um, if you have um, if you use something that employs a in Mexico, and you give them a U.S. non-compete, uh, that's not enforceable in Mexico. Right? It's not. What we uh, sometimes do, though, is if we have some leverage in the United States, we have an indemnification provision that is enforceable in the U.S. Now, I have not had to do that, um, and whether a U.S. judge is going to interpret Mexican law or or try to interpret U.S. law. If they interpret Mexican law, you lose. So, one good question for Nan on to that. Do you see uh, joint ventures in the form of the Davis family form business in Mexico as such? Is there a way? Yeah, um, we do see joint ventures, um, and it's kind of a look-see method. Um, in I'm doing um, a deal in Brazil right now. That's uh, kind of a joint venture. It's there's a lot of uh, kind of hand wringing that goes on in those deals on both sides, um, because I would say in the Latin American context, especially in family deals, there's a um, a strong sense of losing control, um, and there's a there's a mistrust because everything is so you know reliant upon you know powers of attorney and relationships and things of that sort. But um, but I'm seeing more uh, more joint venture deals that have you know uh, provisions for um, you know options to acquire uh, majority interests or 100% uh, interest. Thank you. Okay, good morning. So I think uh, as Rich introduced me already, I won't go into my background, but I'm Bob Oberlees. I am in the corporate group at uh, Fredrickson. I also uh, oversee our China practice group and uh, lived over in China for many years. I'm going to talk about China M&A and um, some trends. I'll start with some trends. Oh, sorry. There we go. So um, in the 20 minutes I have, I'm going to cover some trends, look at opportunities, look at some challenges, talk a little bit about structuring China deals offshore, onshore, and then I'll say a few words about post-closing integration because often in the context of global deals or China deals, a lot of the kind of post-closing things get short shrift and they actually can cause a lot of complications <laughs> after the deal is done. Important to kind of begin with the end in mind. So first, I'll talk a little bit about opportunities. The, I think if we, as we've all read, China is sort of pivoting, transitioning from a, a very um, a period of 30 years of double-digit growth to one of slower, more manageable growth. And so uh, we're now looking at 6% growth, and it's going to be like that for the next 10 years or so. And when President Xi came into power in 2012, he instituted a bunch of policies to kind of slow down the economy a bit. And some said it was a bit of a hard landing. And now China is introducing new regulations to kind of uh, make China more attractive for foreign investment. And, and so we've seen over the last few years a, a bit of a dip. And now it's kind of coming out of that dip in terms of foreign investment, trying to be attractive. Very important for China to stay kind of the preeminent destination for FDI and M&A dollars compared to like India and, and some other countries in the region. And so they're very much focused on uh, maintaining their competitiveness. So a few opportunities for foreign companies right now, because if you're a foreign company and you have cash to invest, 
you have, uh, if you can offer em employment to, uh, I mean, right now the unemployment rate in China is actually coming down a bit, but for a while, the last couple of years, the, the ranks of the unemployed were increasing. And so companies that were laying off were having mass layoffs and, and downsizing were encountering more and more resistance from local authorities. And so if you're a foreign company and you're going to be bringing in a new investment and, um, and you can employ people, generally you're going to have a little bit more leverage than you did in the past. I think Pat mentioned in, in Mexico there's a, there's a bit of an opportunity in terms of the value of the dollar versus the local currency. Same dynamic in, in China right now. The renminbi, despite efforts by the government to prop it up, it's actually it continues to devalue. And then the, the strength of the dollar we all know about. So assets are much cheaper in China, and we're seeing um, anecdotally some increase in M&A for that reason. Um, price increases, for many years, China was being sort of perceived as being expensive, a more and more expensive place to do business. Uh, labor w wages were going up, the cost of doing business was going up, and because of the slowing economy, <laughs> there is some relief in, in that increase. Wages continue to go up, but not at the same pace they were in the past. The push to urbanize and to pivot from being kind of the manufacturer to, to the world to a consumer-driven innovation economy, this is really important for Beijing. And we're seeing um, right now, I think, the GDP is made up of about 35% of consumer spending in China compared to the U.S. We're at like 65%. So China wants to move that needle um, just a little bit each year. And so a big focus is on consumer spending. And we're seeing a lot more investment uh, by foreign investors in the uh, consumer spending sectors. The challenges, some of them are new. Some of them have been there from the beginning. Uh, one that is that each year is, is somewhat new is the competition locally from Chinese companies is getting tougher year on year. They're, they're bigger, they have more money, they have more resources, and uh, we're seeing them compete more effectively in China and, and globally. Uneven playing field, this has always been an issue for foreign companies when you're investing, you're buying companies. You might find a really attractive Chinese target that has done pretty well. Doesn't mean that you as a foreign company can do as well. There's certain ways that they can operate in the country that you can't as a foreign investor. And so the, the uneven playing field and certain advantages that are built into the system are, are just sort of the nature of the game. I mentioned wages. The, although it's slowing a bit, um, they continue to go up. And so compared to the Vietnams and the Indias and these other countries, it's still a high uh, uh, wage destination right now. But productivity is much higher than these other countries. So the... Uh, Pearl River Delta region has about has a has a it's always been a, a very sort of the most dynamic uh, part of the economy in the last 30 years and a lot of the manufacturers there are investing very heavily in automation and robotics and what they're finding is yes wages are going up but productivity is outpacing the the, the increases in wages and so we're seeing that um, it's a challenge but if you have the right approach to it as a, as a foreign investor you can can stay ahead of that. When President Xi came in on board, not, not only did he institute a, a really tough anti-corruption campaign that I think we were all aware of, he also instituted a much stricter enforcement of all laws that are on the books. And so for a lot of foreign companies, they were feeling a bit squeezed. The prices were going up. And also all these environmental laws and other laws that no one ever enforced, now people are coming knocking and saying, hey, where's that permit? And making sort of the cost of doing business um, uh, to go up. And, and so I think that's part of the environment right now. Political uncertainty, we've already talked about that. President Xi, a bit of a strong man. He's um, in the middle of his first term. He's supposed to serve until for 10 years total. There's rumors that he's going to go for 15 years uh, together with the Trump administration. Unclear whether, you know, how, how both sides will navigate that. The... This is just a chart that shows kind of M&A, total M&A, inbound, domestic, outbound from 2012 to 2016. And it's kind of interesting when you, you see that 
in almost every metric from 2012, the, there's been an increase in volume and value for the, for the most part. And generally, you can see here, um, outbound deals surge. I'll try to use a pointer here, although if you look in the last column in 2016, one of the, so it's a general, general increase in volume and value. Outbound deals surged in a very big way in 2016. The, and that's despite significant efforts by the Chinese government to curtail outflows of capital. So, and if you look at that, so that's, um, if you look over, so this is outbound. So SOEs, state-owned enterprises here, you see in 2012, they've, had, they've been pursuing a policy of going outward for the last decade. But usually, for the most part, it was led by the big state-owned enterprises. And you see here, 2012, 41 deals, 55 deals, 78 deals, 80 deals, 116 deals. And you saw the value also increase, 35 billion, 36 billion, a little bit of a dip, 27, and then a big increase here. But the big story was the private companies, the private Chinese companies, 124 deals, 118, 145, 207, 612 in 2016. So a massive increase. And then by, by value as well, 10 billion, you know, 10, 13 billion, 21 billion, and then 116 billion in 2016. So a, just a, a, a real shift in terms of the desire by these Chinese companies to go outbound. And part of that reflects a, a policy shift in Beijing to go out, acquire technology from Western companies and bring it back to China and, and fuel this sort of next stage in growth where they're pivoting to more innovative, higher tech companies. But uh, in 2015, over a trillion dollars left China, and that concerned Beijing in a very big way. And so, although they want companies to go outbound, they're also putting in major restrictions to prevent that, to kind of filter out the illegitimate transactions and let, let through only the legitimate transactions. And trying to figure that out, and who are the gatekeepers, whether it's the banks or the regulators, is very difficult. And so you're seeing that a lot of uh, legitimate deals are getting stuck in that. And we've seen that in the past year. Many deals get started, and then you get through diligence, and then you get to the point you've negotiated the purchase agreement, and now it's time to go to, to, to see the regulators, and things just get put on hold. And so lots of deals start and then just get stalled, and that's part of the reason. And this was a massive increase in 2016. What we're seeing now is a significant dip. So 2017 looks like the outbound trend will continue, but a lot of these regulations are now starting to have a very big impact. And so we've seen a significant dip in the first two months of 2017. And inbound from foreign investors into China, we've seen a significant increase in the first two months of 2017. This is just a chart that, that kind of summarizes deal value over the same period, 2012, 2013 to 2016. So here it's just, you can see that total deal value, another record year for 2016, and just a general, you know, very substantial increase when you look at the total, whether it's domestic, outbound, inbound. Um, the, again, for, if you look at the, the uh, outbound, the massive increase there for outbound Chinese companies right here, um, compared to last year, 63 to 220 billion. Um, that, again, that trend will continue, but maybe significantly less for, for um, or a little bit of a, uh, a decrease probably in 2017. Okay, with that, I'll just say a few words about deal structuring issues. And often for China deals, you're, you're, the, the deal structure is determined by the target. And in some cases, if you're the foreign investor, preferably your ideal target would be a Chinese business that has an offshore holding company that's in the Cayman Islands or BVI or Hong Kong. That's the best way to do it because then you have the common law protections you have the, you could structure the deal in many of the very similar ways to how you would do it in the U.S. And for a lot of private equity buyers, they, to do the deal, they often employ a significant amount of leverage. 
Leverage deals work quite well offshore. They don't work very well at all onshore. Equity compensation, incentive compensation is an important part for many of these deals as well. And the, the, the challenge onshore in China is that you can't grant, you can't create a pool of 10% for certain employees without giving them certain commensurate voting, voting rights over the business. Offshore, if it's in Hong Kong or, or Cayman Islands, it's, that's fine. And so that's a significant difference. Again, the common terms that investors are accustomed to in the U.S. and, and in other markets, the U.K., the put call options, drag and tag, certain purchase price adjustments, escrows, again, they work very well offshore, not very well onshore. Exit routes are also more transparent when you're, when you're offshore. So you're going to, you're a private equity buyer and you're going to buy a Chinese business, but it's held in, in Hong Kong. You have a very clear sense that a uh, very clear picture of how you can get out and that you'll be able to get your money out. Um, and the market also is probably in you know, the market for a, a Chinese business, a very attractive Chinese business that's held in Hong Kong would be much more attractive to, um, to foreign buyers than one that's domestically based. So some of the, the cons to the offshore structure is that China has, or the regulators in Beijing have become very concerned over the last few years about the Chinese businesses and Chinese entrepreneurs taking really valuable businesses and moving them offshore. So you think of the, the big ones that you read about in the papers, Alibaba, Baidu, all of these, these started as Chinese businesses, and then they restructured the business to move them to Hong Kong or to the Cayman Islands, and then they list overseas. And so Chinese in Beijing was, was not very happy about that because essentially right when the business was exploding, it, the ownership was offshore. And so that was removing from, from the Chinese tax authorities and other, other regulators the ability to, to tax and to, to regulate aspects of the business. So... Over the last few years, they've, they've passed a number of regulations that are meant to restrict that. And so often when you, what we find is that the, the foreign investors looking at a certain M&A project, if it, if it involves certain Chinese owners, depending on how they structure the business, even if it's offshore, they may not be able to do the deal because the Chinese owners never got the required approvals, it, essentially, there's certain fundamental defects in the way the business is, is structured given current uh, regulations in China. I'll go on to um, so onshore. Often, it's the only way <coughs> to take positions in certain sectors that are, are subject to certain foreign investment limitations, and often for certain targets that particularly that, you know, for businesses that were formed over the last three or four years, they are, they can't do, if it's a Chinese run business, they can't form it offshore. And so they will they'll start it as a Chinese business. It's going to be based in Shanghai. There's no way you can help, you know, help them to restructure and move it to the Cayman Islands or Hong Kong. We used to be able to do that. You can't really do that anymore. So you're stuck with a Chinese M&A deal. There's some advantages, though, in terms of um, now that you can do, uh, you can exit on the A-share market as a foreign invested company that was not available in the past. Um, the, there's certain, um, again, for, for, for certain investments with like the new, uh, whether it's a new Alibaba, the new Baidu that is, is going to be domestically based, this is sort of the only way you can do the deal, uh, depending on what the sector is. Some of the, the limitations I've already mentioned, it, it highly restricts the way that you can structure earnouts, purchase price adjustments, a lot of the things that the, a typical U.S. investor or foreign investor are comfortable with. You can't do it that way in China, and so you're limited to the, the, uh, the restrictions under the EJV law and the company law in terms of how you're actually going to do the deal. As I mentioned um, we do a lot of we do a lot of U.S. M&A where there are China pieces. We do a lot of China M&A as well. But often China comes along in the U.S. or global M&A context. There's China businesses that are part of the deal, 
and there might be a very significant U.S. business, and then the, the deal guys are looking at China and saying, well, we already have a facility in Beijing. The Target's got one in Shanghai. We'll just merge them afterwards, and we'll shut that one down, and we'll consolidate, and we'll, we'll spin off certain assets. And I think it's for China, it's really important to think through that plan and how that's actually going to work, because often it's a lot more costly and, and time-consuming than people anticipate. So the uh, disposal of unwanted assets, this is one where maybe in the U.S. context works pretty well. And you, you can just kind of spin off certain things. You can combine them with existing businesses. Doesn't work very well in China. Scaling the operations down, you know, say, well, we have our operations in Beijing. We're not going to need that team in Shanghai. Let's just, we'll, we'll sort of do a significant, you know, reduction in force. Again, very difficult to do in China, and you need to think through how that's going to work. Liquidations, this happens all the time. You want to do a deal, and there's a, a couple facilities in China that the, the buyer is not all that interested in. The cost of liquidating a very simple woofy is, can be easily over $100,000, and it's going to take you between 12 months and 18 months to do. So, again, in the U.S. context, this might seem like a very simple thing to do and, and very inexpensive, and it's just the opposite in China. So you need to think about that. And sometimes you'd say, we don't really want that. We want to carve that out of the deal ahead of time. That's your problem. We don't, we don't need that headache. Similarly, particularly in global M&A, you have, you're going to you don't negotiate the purchase price, between signing and closing, there's certain items that are going to happen. And then uh, around closing, you'll, you'll switch out board of you know, the, the officers and directors. This can be done very simply, very quickly in the U.S. context. Uh, in China, changing your board can take months. A legal rep can take three months. These are things that can impact the severance that you negotiate with the outgoing management because you want them to be cooperating uh, because you're going to need their help to, to switch them out. And, and usually so they'll, they'll need to sign something to, to either a resignation letter or something. So you want them to be cooperating in that process. And changing of business scope, moving offices, all of these things. The, the bottom line is that the Chinese government continues to be involved in just about every facet of your business in China. And so even very simple corporate changes, typically it's going to take some sort of government filing or approval to get done. So again, you might have an office in Shanghai in Puxi, and the target has one in Pudong, and you say, well, we're just going to move it across the, across the river. Well, again, that's a government approval process that's going to take many months to get done. So I think I'm going to wrap up here, uh, and, uh, but hopefully that gave you a, a little bit of a flavor for the China M&A market. <laughs> Thank you to the speakers for great presentations. I know that Harley's not here, but maybe he's in the back yet. Must be his Romanian Italian deal that's uh, blowing up on him, but he did say he'd be back. Um, I know a few people already asked questions of Pat, but if you have any other questions for Pat or Bob, we're happy to entertain them now. Jim. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Pat, one of the uh, uh, bullet points you had was uh, basically strong dollar peso. Well, that's changed in the last few months. Yeah, it's peso's gotten stronger. And you and I had breakfast a couple months ago, and we talked about how you know surge in purchases in Brazil because it was the time to do it. It was it was timely. How do you see the situation in Mexico? You know, you talked about um, lower dollar lower volume of transactions. I can't remember what it was. One was down 8%, one was up 2%. How do you, what do you see for the future of the next year in Mexico? Um, I think it, it, it's, it depends so much on what happens with NAFTA. Um, and the latest I've heard um, is that the administration is kind of backing off. Yeah. They're pulling back on that and saying, yeah, we're going to tweak it here and we're going to tweak it there. And, it, you know, if that happens, then I think you'll see a steady, um, a 
steady flow of deals. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, in the places where we have our uh, our office, uh, you know, we're in Saltillo and Monterrey, which is kind of where a lot of the auto industry is, and um, there's a huge amount of investment going on in those plants. Um, and so, despite the concerns about a you know a, a border tax, that seems to be you know continuing, and uh, and it's just too close. I mean, I don't, they, the, the countries are too intertwined in terms of trade, and those uh, those manufacturing plants are not going to go. So away. you're still bullish on Mexico. I'm still bullish on Mexico, Brazil. I you know I go like this, and you know, every time I think it's uh, it's going to happen, something happens and it doesn't happen. So, um, but it's still a huge market, and you know. Latin America in general, I think, is a, is a an area for future growth. Um, governments are, by and large, kind of becoming more um, open to trade and uh, you know, liberalizing in that way. So hopefully we'll see an increase elsewhere as well. Colombia, Peru, um, see what happens. You again, Pat. Um, Brazil has always been one of the most restrictive countries when it comes to import duties and tax and triple tax and all those things. Do you see any change in that ever coming down the road? Um, well, I've been I've been expecting that change for you know 28 years now. Uh, yeah, crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, I think that Brazil has this attitude that you kind of have to march to our music. And so I, I haven't seen much uh, in terms of, of changes uh, that are on the horizon. I don't know if anyone else has heard anything, but where I, you know, where I tend to emphasize um, the benefits in Brazil is that most of those taxes everybody else has to pay too. Uh, they're being paid domestically, so there's the, you know, the import duties are still uh, hard to chew on. I've got more clients who are um, doing the joint ventures and the uh, acquisitions in Brazil now um, to you know, get, the, get the footprint in the country so that they can start manufacturing and sourcing materials there, and that, you know, that, that changes the, the, the equation substantially. The, the, the problem with the circuit is that it's the import duties and taxes, and then it's the incentive for companies to be global. Right. I've not financed a deal in Brazil. Um, all the deals I've done have been financed. In fact, one of the strong reasons for, for the Brazilian seller to do the deal is to have access to cheap financing. Uh, because that's, you know, for a Brazilian company, expansion in Brazil is very difficult unless you're you know, Petrobras, which, well, yeah. who, knows, who knows if that's, uh, uh, if that's a uh, true statement anymore. But, I mean, it, it's... There's a strong incentive to look for outside financing because it's a difficult one. Michelle, I was going to add that if there's any trend in Brazil, that I'm, because we're both working on a lot of Brazilian deals, it is doing that joint venture and trying to get away from the import duties and finding a local partner and doing something so you can be local in, in Brazil. Yeah, we're, no, seeing, we're seeing more and more of that because Americans and other foreign companies are simply fed up with those import duties and, and the red tape of trying to get your products into Brazil. Yeah, I've got a client who acquired a, uh, a plant as a result of an acquisition, and the plant is in the middle of a neighborhood, um, which nobody seems to be disturbed about. Um, but when they got to the point where they didn't have enough room, there's no room to expand, and now we're looking at another building. And, and the building was owned by a family, and one of the family members died, and all of a sudden we're tied up for 12 months because they have to go through a probate, and there's no way to transfer the building without going through this process. So, you know, it's, you just have to be uh, aware when you step outside of the United States that um, you need to know the, you need to know the playing field and you have to be uh, a little bit more agile.
and a little bit more open-minded. Bob, you spoke a little about the pros and cons of onshore versus offshore from an M and A perspective. What are you seeing for Wolfie's? Uh, you know, fairly straightforward trading Wolfie or manufacturing Wolfie ownership of that being offshore versus onshore through a Q sub or something else. Yeah, I think for Wolfie's, <coughs> we're seeing a lot of Wolfie's being formed right now. The not necessarily in free trade zones, but just general trading Wolfie's and. They can be done, those are being done more, less and less um, uh, expensively, I guess. The, traditionally, you'd have to put in at least $500,000, million. That cost is coming down significantly. You can set up a woofie now for fifty grand. Uh, so I would say mainland China woofies are, are more and more common. Any other questions for our panelists? Bob, so I have a client that's a Beijing-based company, and they have a they have an entity in Hong Kong, and they've been sending money here for things that are purchased for them. How do they? How does the Chinese company, privately held, get money into Hong Kong under the current government restrictions? Um, they've been telling me that it's if I difficult for them to buy things that are not tangible, like a license, drawings, intellectual property. But if it's Met sheet metal, it's great because the import records and customs can officially say yes, there's, there's something coming in here. But intellectual properties and that type of stuff seem to be difficult for them to get money out of the country. Would you mind comment on that? Yeah, I would say over the last ten years, if you look at that picture. It's it's harder now than it's ever been, and particularly for Chinese companies, those are the real targets for a lot of these new regulations. They are there's so much money that has been moved offshore that. Even, again, legitimate transactions, uh, contract for services, equipment, these are getting sort of snagged in that net. And so often it's not necessarily they can't do it, it's just a matter of time. So something that used to take, let's say, a month might take eight months or, or more. So it is, and that's also for foreign companies. Traditionally, you could get you know, purchase price out, you can get dividends out generally without much difficulty, and now that's not necessarily true. Uh, dividends much harder for foreign companies. Purchase price still pretty easy, um, but uh, it just takes a little bit longer. Any other questions? Well, with that, I thank all of you for coming and uh, and attending our seminar. Be on the lookout for our next seminar. You know, we do this every uh, couple of months, so by all means, we'll uh, we'll inform you of course of our next seminar. And I think the marketing department will kill me if I don't tell you that the, their evaluation sheets uh, at your table, so please fill them out, because I have no idea what the marketing department does with them, but they do something with them, so there you go. And thanks again for coming, and have a great day.